the Traspers. Hey, Bay City, we miss you guys. Can't wait to see you again. Hi, Bay City Church. We, we miss, miss you. you. Hope you're having fun. <laughs> set for you to show that your presence knows no bounds. And when your word comes to pass, let us not be the ones to miss you, for your spirit and your word reign supreme to every issue. For there's nothing new under the sun that your son hasn't overcome, and when we begin to make room, there's no capacity that your presence can't exceed. For you're a God that not only knows, but meets every need. There's no depth that you won't go and no distance that you can't cross. No mess that you can't clean and no dark place that your light cannot gleam. May they know that the Father's heart plays no small part from start to finish. They know that you're a God with no limits. From nation to nation, from this generation to the next, let your will be done even after the record reflects. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his Children and the children and the children. 
morning Bay City Church. We're so glad uh, that we get another opportunity to sing together, to learn together uh, here through uh, YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're joining us. We're so glad that you're tuning in. I want to begin by uh, reading from Psalm uh, 103. And it's David saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. Throughout the rest of the psalm, he then lists reasons why we should bless the Lord and bless His name. And verse 8 says, Because the Lord is merciful and He is gracious, He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This morning we get the opportunity to sing about His love, to remember what He has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's sing this song together. love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing lust the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the 
upon that cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed to hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffer. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast on Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from this reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom what should i gain from this reward i cannot give an answer but this i know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom
soak in all your glory. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much because we know that above all circumstances that you're sovereign, that you're in control. And Father, for those reasons, we praise you. We give you all the honor and the praise and the song that you deserve, Lord. So would you take it and may it honor you. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Bay City Church. We have a few announcements before we get into the message. During this season, we want to make sure that everyone is able to get plugged into a church family. If you are new to Bay City or simply haven't connected with us yet, we would like to invite you to be a part of our community. Simply visit baycitysf.info and click either First Time Submitting or Bay City is My Home Church. You'll be able to submit prayer requests, find out about serving opportunities, or get the Spotify playlist for our worship set. You can also find out more about how to be a part of our city groups. City groups are our midweek gatherings where we get to interact with other people from our church, study the Bible, and pray together. During this time, our city groups have all moved to gather online through Zoom. Join a group today at baycitysf.info. One of the ways in which we worship God is through giving. We serve a generous God, and we want to honor Him through our giving. That's why during this unusual time, we are giving 10% of our giving back to help people, organizations, and businesses that have been directly affected by COVID-19. You can give financially on baycitysf.info, or you can go to baycity.church give to set up one-time or recurring donations. You can also give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. We hope you partner with us in serving those in need. Even though we are not physically meeting together, we want to continue to be a church that prays together. We are hosting a prayer meeting through Zoom, and we would love for you to join us. Bring your prayer requests as we gather to pray for our city and for each other. You can find a link on our website. If you are looking for ways to go deeper into studying God's Word, visit baycity.church resources. Here you will be able to find a list of our recommended books and websites that will help you in your walk. Don't go at life alone. Connect with us now at baycitysf.info. Now go ahead and grab a Bible as we get ready to study God's Word. Well, good morning, Bay City Church. Glad you could uh, join us again. And uh, happy June, by the way. It's uh, good to be with you guys. I've got my uh, ESV uh, study journey journal here from with the Philippians. So remember, we've got some of those. And so uh, put your information in, baycitysf.info. Would love to send you one of these just as our gift and just to let you know we're thinking about you. Hey, um, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 again. This is our third week in Philippians chapter 2. Grab a physical Bible and meet me in verse 19. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pray for us. I'll give you some time and uh, see if the Lord blesses us and uh, we'll get to work right in this message. By the way, we're talking about purpose, so it should be a fun one. Lord Jesus, thank you again for another week to get to share the scriptures with my friends. It is so great combing a rich ancient work like this. And really seeing the sort of character the Apostle Paul has and what he brings up and what is important to him and what's important um, to the Philippians. And so, Lord, I pray you illuminate the scriptures for us. Would you limit my humanity and just exemplify and exalt your divinity? Would that just come out in droves here this morning so we could all understand who you are and what you've done? In his name, amen. Many many people ask this question, and I'm sure you've asked this question too. What am I really doing with my life? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Have you asked any of those questions? I know I've asked those questions constantly. And there's a lot of confusion around purpose. In fact, millions of blogs are written on purpose. Millions. millions. You, can, you can click around all day on every website reading the amount of different articles there are on purpose. And they're going to tell you how to get yours, 10 steps to find your purpose, three steps to find your purpose. When they, if they get any shorter than, you know, honestly, quite honestly, three or four steps to purpose, I feel like, ah, that's probably not my purpose, okay? That's too short. I need, I, there's probably more to my purpose than wake up in the morning, brush your teeth, think positive. There's more than that, right? And things get a little bit more complicated too when you start bringing in bigger, doc, bigger documents like, I don't know, let's t- think about the Declaration of Independence, like that document is the foundational document that undergirds our entire country. And this is their definition of purpose. This is what you go after for your life. Life, liberty, 
and happiness. Oh wait, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, they didn't want to guarantee you happiness, okay? They didn't actually want to do that. They guaranteed you life and liberty, and they guaranteed you not happiness, but you can try to find happiness. Good luck with that, okay? You may get it, you may not. There you have it. Embedded in the American ethos right there, embedded in it is a vision statement for your life. Life, liberty, and pursuing happiness. And so that's why we're all doing it. We're all searching around, trying to figure out what we're meant for, what the meaning is of our lives. How do we get happy? How do we find it? Fast forward, of course, to 2019, and this pursuit has really just become even more convoluted. Marketing, consumption, it's all mucked up the pursuit of happiness. Now, if you watch television and watch commercials or watch ads on a YouTube video, many of us are gonna think happiness is uh, buying a new Lexus eating at Chipotle, or even visiting a specific brand of hotel like a Marriott, okay? You wanna be happy? Go to a Courtyard Marriott. You wanna be happy? Buy an Alexis LX 590 or whatever. That's how you become happy. That's how you find your purpose. So we're all confused about how to do this. And we're looking for the right answer. But what if there is no right answer? At least not within ourselves. What, what if there's not actually a clear picture of for the world of how we're supposed to find our purpose or what our purpose could be. What if our created perspective is limited and we're actually not capable of discovering our purpose? I know most of us think humanity has evolved, and it has quite a bit, I mean, at least in terms of thought and technology. But you know, something interesting happened in the news recently. We just discovered that our universe is actually one billion years younger than we thought it was. One billion years younger than we thought. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but that's a lot of years to be wrong by, okay? That's a lot of years to be wrong by. They think, now scientists believe that the universe is actually now expanding faster than it was. It's expeeding up in its expansion. In fact, they think it's expanding 9% faster. Scientists believe that we need now to discover, quote, new physics to explain the phenomenon. Remember how, like, science was the foundation of everything? And, like, if it's not, if it's scientific then we're good, right? Well, physicists now believe they need new physics. <laughs> so if you believe in physics, throw the book out. We need, to figure, we need to discover new physics to help us understand what's happening. Here's a quote from uh, John Hopkins University astronomer Adam Reese. He says this, it's looking more and more like we're going to need something new to explain this. Doesn't sound like a guy that really knows what he's looking at, right? And he admits that himself. There's actually a chance that, Re chance that Reese's explanation is actually incorrect and something actually sped up the acceleration of the universe. Something sped it up. At some point in the last dozen billion years, they think something's made it quicker. They think it could have been dark energy, but we really don't understand dark energy either. So I don't know, basically. NASA astrophysicist John Mather told AP that there are two possibilities about this whole phenomenon. One. We're making mistakes we don't see, or two, nature has something new we can't find yet. And I would argue three, both. <laughs> you don't know what you're looking at, and you're wrong what you, are, what you think you know, okay? That's probably more than likely what's happening. Things we were so sure of just a few years ago all of a sudden become huge question marks. So how can we be sure we know the formula to purpose if we don't even know the purpose, the formula to physics, or the formula to our, what we can see how can we claim to understand the transcendent when we can't even understand the physical? Well, here's the Christian perspective. Christians believe that authentic transcendent purpose comes from our maker, okay? Comes from our maker, comes from God. And we believe this, that when we remove God from the explanation of ourselves, we fail to discover real purpose. You see, people are often trying to, oftentimes trying to discover their purpose, and the reason many people don't see their purpose is because they don't have the, the number one factor involved, and that's God. Paul in this text, he diverts away from talking about Jesus for just a second and moves into uh, talk about these two seemingly random men that are kind of coming out of nowhere. In fact, this text feels like it's kind of out of left field. But these men, what connects us to purpose is that these two men look like they've found their purpose. I don't know if you think, I don't know if you know if you found yours yet, but these two men have found theirs. And the key to their life is that they fully included God into it. They fully included God, and in doing so, they discovered their purpose. And by the way, these guys are not superstars either. They're just regular people living their lives. And so they find purpose without superstardom. Just regular people, not movie stars, not politicians, not historical powerhouse figures even. Just regular people like you and I. 
we have much to learn from them and what we can and what can we learn from them here's the first thing your purpose may come in a form you least expect your purpose may come in a form you least expect. Now, the first name Paul mentions in this passage is a guy named Timothy. And you may have heard of Timothy because Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Timothy. A lot of the books are named after their authors, right? Um, John, Matthew, Luke. This book, the first books is 1st and 2nd Timothy, were not written by Timothy. They're written by Paul. Confusing, okay? But Paul had a good relationship with Timothy. That's how maybe you've heard of him. And he's mentioned some in the Bible, but look how he mentions them here in verse 19. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. Talking again about the Philippians. He's sending, he wants to send Timothy to them. So that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Now, Timothy, he's written a handful of times about in the Bible. He's mentioned roughly nine times in the Bible and then 24 times he's kind of alluded to in the scriptures. And so he's a character in the Bible, but he's not a large character. He's not Elijah. He's not David. He's not Peter. He's not, he's not Paul. He's a smaller character, okay? Not very mentioned. But even so, there's much to learn about him, even though he's not mentioned that often. We know that he traveled with Paul during his work in Ephesus. We know that. We know that Paul got in all sorts of trouble. We've been talking about it, remember. Stoned, shipwrecked, beaten, jailed like he is currently, knocked unconscious, okay? We know Paul got into some trouble. Timothy was with him during a lot of that. Timothy was there. And listen, there is no flash to this guy at all. He doesn't get any cool speeches like Stephen the Martyr. He doesn't even get any crazy salvation moments. He doesn't like get to walk on water like Jesus. Of course, he couldn't walk on water like Jesus. He gets no cool story. So there's no flash. He doesn't write any of the Bible. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Timothy wrote zilch, nothing. He mostly just is a demonstrated himself as a companion of Paul and other people. And that's the beauty in Timothy, is that's what he did. He played his role well. Verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the Judaizers, the, the, the haters, the other people. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son and with a father, with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Though Timothy isn't known as one of these heavyweight giants of the faith like Paul or Peter or John, he was faithful in the responsibilities he had. Now Paul actually references Timothy as a spiritual son in the faith. That's how close Timothy was to him, even though there was no flash for him. He just played his role, woke up every morning, and went to work with his lunch pail, came home, rested in his bed after a long day's work is following God. That's all he did. And this is where we learn there is greatness in, in the, even the smallest things done for Jesus. Man, these, these small things, the everyday, the mundane acts of following God in faith, are the things that God is glorified by. And you have to know that. But the trouble with this is that we read stories like Paul's and we get jealous. Let's just be honest. I mean, we don't actually want to go through it, but man, it would be cool if that kind of was part of our story. His story is that he is this crazy uh, vigilante. Like he, he's known by the Roman soldiers. He's not a vigilante. He's known by the Roman guard and he oversees the execution of people like Stephen the martyr. And then he, as he's going to go kill more Christians, Jesus visits him in the flesh. Right there, <clears throat> visits him and stops him and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you can imagine all this white light around him. And he goes, I am Jesus. And then boom, Paul loses his eyesight. And it's like, oh man, three days. And then finally he gets his eyesight back and he becomes a believer in all these amazing things. And then he starts preaching to people and getting saved and going on these cool trips. And we think, so cool, man. What an origin story. That's true. We all want our own cool, crazy origin story. You know, we all want that. We all want the story where we're maybe a billionaire young boy walking down the street and all of a sudden our parents get murdered. And then one day as we're ascending up, growing up, we fall into an old well and bats fly around us and we become Batman. And now we're a vigilante fighting crime, right? We want this cool story. Or maybe we want to be a genius high school student who gets bitten by a radioactive spider and then acquires acrobatic abilities and can climb walls and gets a weird costume and calls himself Spider-Man. We want these cool origin stories for ourselves. But Timothy, Timothy's story, well, just old Tim. That's it. No origin. Nothing crazy. Just a faithful servant of Paul's. A faithful servant of Jesus. 
You know, God has a way of allowing ordinary people to produce extraordinary results. And he does that through Timothy. During Paul's secondary missionary journey, we learn that Timothy had an exceptional reputation amongst the Christians in that town. An exceptional reputation. Paul knew him because he was just a faithful guy, living his life, being kind to people. You know, there's something to be said to just being a good citizen in this life. Reduce the suffering in this world by just being a good person. That's what Timothy did. Words of his reputation made it around town without any sort of superstardom attached to his name. Powerful. My question for you is this. Where have you overlooked an opportunity to be used by God in an ordinary way? Where have you overlooked an opportunity to be used by God in an ordinary way? Your purpose may be exactly the place you least expect to find it, in the mundane and in the ordinary. What else do we learn from this text? The full impact of your purpose doesn't always show itself. It doesn't always show itself. Now in verse 25, we're introduced to an even lesser known character, okay? Epaphroditus, okay? And Epaphroditus was a Greek guy. In fact, his name comes from the name Epaphrodite, the Greek god. She was a Greek goddess, and he was named after that. His name means of Epaphrodite. He was a Greek convert, okay? He was just a, a guy, he was just a guy, pretty much. Look at verse 25. I thought it necessary, Paul says, to, to send to to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. Epaphroditus is only mentioned in this book, in the Philippians, and that's it. Nowhere else in scripture do we get this guy's name. What do we know about him, if anything? Well, we know Paul was under arrest, right? He was under house arrest in Rome. And by the way, house arrest is not then is not the same as house arrest now. When you're under house arrest today, you have a bathroom in your house, a full kitchen, probably got Amazon Prime, Amazon boxes, internet. Paul didn't have any of that, okay? He was basically in a jail cell, essentially. <laughs> that was his house arrest, okay? And so Paul was in Rome under house arrest, and the church at Philippi desired to send Paul like a care package. They, they essentially were financially and provisionally supporting Paul. Okay? And so they wanted to give him resources, give him money perhaps, give him supplies, give him food. And so they sent this guy, Epaphroditus, with the supplies. And so and you can read it right there in the text. It says, in verse 18 says, he ministered to my need. That's what's happening here. And then Paul, though, calls him a fellow, a fellow worker and a fellow soldier. And even a brother, he calls him. Powerful. Now, what else do we know about this? We know, look at, if we, if we fast forward a little bit to chapter 4, verse 18, we get a little bit more context. It says this, I have received full payment and more, talking about getting gifts from the Philippians. I am well supplied, having received in it from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. He was the deliverer of a care package to Paul. That's what his, that's what his job was. Such a small task, Right? This is, his, this is his claim to fame. This is his one shot to get in the Bible, okay? And what does he do? He's a, an Amazon UPS truck driver for one day. That's what he is. He drives the gifts over. But we find that not only did Epaphroditus just deliver this gift to Paul and to bless him, he was also entrusted with the delivery of this letter we're reading right now, the book of Philippians, to the church at Philippi. He was entrusted. So, Epaphroditus is given the care package. He goes to Paul. He gives him the care package. And Paul then writes Philippians and gives them the letter. And he goes back to the church at Philippi for them to read in their, in their gatherings. Do you understand what's happening here? We're reading the book of Philippians now. We find that he was entrusted with the letter of Philippians, a letter that not only impacted Philippi in the time, but has impacted potentially billions of people that have read it over the last 2,000 years. God often multiplies a purpose fulfilled. We may not see the end result of what God is telling us to do. God may be telling us to talk to a person that's going to change the world about Jesus. God may be telling us to save a kid who will one day invent an incredible invention. God may be asking us just to love our kids because through our family line one day we'll rise up somebody special. You just do not know the impact of the little things God is calling you into. And sometimes we don't have full clarity but simply playing the role God gives, however small, leads to the largest kingdom impact. Last thing we learn about purpose in this is to remember the cost of purpose. Remember the cost of following your purpose. Now remember, Paul's sitting in jail, 
as he pens this letter. And imagine, I don't know what it'd be like to be in jail, but he's probably looking around. Maybe he looks around and he sighs. <sighs> Look what it costs me to follow God. What about Timothy? Probably also in prison. <sighs> Look what it costs me to follow this guy, Paul. And what about Epaphroditus? What was his fate? Verse 26. For he, Epaphroditus, was longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should, be, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Epaphroditus was sick, very sick. Real purpose will cost you opportunity. It will cost you opportunity. Paul was in jail, Timothy in jail, Epaphroditus is sick. When you follow God by process of elimination, you cannot follow something else. Paul followed his purpose and it landed him in prison. Timothy follows his purpose and it lands him in prison. Epaphroditus follows his purpose and it lands him in a hospital bed. And this is the issue with our newest generation. The issue with our newest generation, the one I'm a part of that I, that I, I love, is that we, do, is we value the possibility of opportunity more than rooted purpose. We value the possibility for opportunity than more than rooted purpose. And we say things like, I know what God might be saying, but I just have to keep my options open, you know? I know I'm supposed to be going to this church or maybe living in this city or maybe discipling this person, being in this relationship, but I've got to stay a free agent. Here's what you need to know about that mindset. Keeping your options open is a decision not to act. Most people think keeping your options open is a lack of a decision. No, it is not a lack of a decision, but a decision to not follow what God you know is God is telling you to do. That's what it is. Their decisions, the guys in this book, they led to that, that oof, it, wow, geez, it led them to lose their freedoms. That scares us. But what profit is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or at least gain the possibility of the whole world and lose his soul. That's what Jesus says. And then verse 30 we see, For nearly he, Epaphroditus, died for the work of Christ. Have you ever almost died for something powerful? Wow. Risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Nearly died for the work of Christ. Epaphroditus sacrificed for his purpose. And this is where we need to know that your legacy is found behind your greatest sacrifice. Those unwilling to sacrifice for their purpose are those without legacy. You wanna leave a legacy? Fine, you're not gonna leave one in your Instagram feed. You're not gonna leave one on, on your channel. You're not gonna leave one in your Facebook. You're not gonna leave one even in a journal. You're gonna leave one when you sacrifice. And what you sacrifice for, you leave a legacy for. And the greatest sacrifice you can make is for Christ, just like the one he made for us. Now, for the Christian, there is no purpose void of the gospel. None. The gospel saves us, it empowers us, and it is mandated in order for us to understand our, our purpose. But some of us have overlooked our purpose because we've overlooked Jesus. And I'm here to tell you right now, for those of you that don't know Jesus, I believe your purpose begins with a new identity from him. You're probably watching this and you're thinking, man, I just don't know if I even have a purpose, but I just don't know if I buy this Jesus. You'll never find your purpose without Jesus. You may find a, a phantom purpose. You may find a, uh, maybe something to keep yourself busy until you die, but you will not find the ultimate purpose that rests in following the eternal God. You may live a temporary life full of happiness on your way towards death, or you can embrace the, the purpose that Jesus grants us towards life, a life that's eternal and life that's abundant. That's what we have in him. So you need to come to understand the real truth about the world, that the only purpose is found in the eternal God. And you can claim to understand things like our physicist friends did and say, oh, I, I believe, I know for a fact, because physics told me that the universe is billions and billions of years old, but only come to find years later that you've been wrong the whole time. Or you can live a life meant with real purpose from the eternal God. Your purpose is going to be made preoccupied otherwise by trying to save yourself instead of being who you were made to be by God. You understand? I love you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for my friends who don't know you right now, Lord. I pray that special blessing over them. They may think that that language is even weird that I even said blessing. That might be weird to them, Lord. Grant it to them anyway. 
Lay your Holy Spirit on them, Lord, that they might come to know you in an amazing way, that they might go, something's different about today. Something happened here today. And for my other friends who are just dabbling, Lord, and not solid in their purpose, dabbling even geographically, moving from place to place or within friend groups or trying to figure out them, trying to figure out where they want to be, Lord, would you root them in the purpose that you've given them? I love you, Lord, and, and they love you. I'm sure of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Great talking purpose without, with you guys today. Hey, listen, purpose comes. It doesn't have to have superstardom attached to it. We all are, we are all capable of having our purpose. We don't have to be famous to have purpose, and we find that purpose in Christ. I'll see you next week. together. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to be here and to worship, Lord, through technology. We want to once again praise you and ask you that you would help us uh, to not just uh, praise you on Sunday mornings, uh, but to praise you throughout our week, through our situations. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, Bay City. It was a great Sunday worshiping with you, church family. Remember, don't go at life alone, especially during this unique season. Connect with us at BayCitySF.info and plug in with us so we can all stay encouraged and joyful together. We want to hear from you. See you next week.